Itza's Guide to Dragon Bonding is a supplement for the Dragon Bond Endless Sagas RPG. This is the third video I'm making about Dragon Bond generally, the first covering the various products under the brand created by Draco Studios, including unique miniatures, a war game, and a board game. That video also covered the fictional world of Dragon Bond generally. The second video covered Great Worms of Draca, the adventure supplement for the RPG that pits you against all the major dragons in the setting. This video will go over some of the highlights in one of the RPG's main core rule books. It's his guide to dragon bonding, which at the time of this recording is running on Kickstarter. Draco Studios did sponsor this video, but did not have any involvement in the writing or production of it, besides handing me the materials to read. As always, I will include my honest opinion at the end of the video. Itza's Guide is meant to be the first big splash that Draco Studios makes into its tabletop role-playing product line, which, if you haven't watched my previous videos on Dragon Bond, is all keyed to 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons rules. And like I've mentioned in previous videos, I think 5e is a perfect fit for Dragon Bond, since the world is focused on high-level heroics, has tons of dragons, and is connected with other products that can facilitate battles large and small. It's his guide to dragon bonding is focused on adventuring with a dragon in your party. This is done by way of a feature in the world called dragon bonding, where a two-legged mortal can mentally and spiritually bond with a dragon. There are a ton of other materials offered in the guidebook that runs over 300 pages, but I'm only going to highlight a few of these in this video. First, I'll cover the rules of dragon bonding, and then out of the six new dragon broods and 50 plus new monsters, I'll just be covering the Exor dragon and Wada. As for the classes and subclasses, I'll go over four of the subclasses, and finally do a very brief preview of the free adventure, Escape from the City of Crimson Spires, which is being released with the Kickstarter run of Itza's Guide. Arguably the most exciting thing about Itza's Guide to Dragon Bonding, and really of all the Dragon Bond Endless Sagas RPG, is the Dragon Bonding itself. The original rules for how to bond your PC to a dragon were released in the free adventure Escape from the City of Crimson Spires, but I suspect there will be more added in Itza's Guide. Basically, it works like this. Every so often on the harsh continent of Valerna, where dragons invade every couple of decades and ravage all the kingdoms of mortals, a dragon and a mortal will recognize each other as more than just predator and prey. When this mutual understanding occurs, the two can engage in a protracted ritual that bonds them. What this means specifically is that they must both pass four tests, one for each aspect of Vala, which is the magical essence of all living things, and finally, a bonding check. The better they roll on these increasingly difficult Vala checks, the easier that final roll will be. In the free adventure, there are no specifics on how these checks come about in a scene or what they look like, but honestly, I kind of like that. A creative GM can do whatever they want with this, and that's pretty exciting. Anyway, if your PC fails to bond with a dragon, you can never make the attempt again with that dragon, and can't even attempt to bond with another dragon for 1d4 weeks. But if you do succeed in bonding with a dragon, you gain the following pretty incredible combination of effects. You become immune to whatever breath weapon your dragon counterpart uses. You can not only read and speak draconic, but can communicate telepathically with your dragon up to 120 feet away. You get your dragon's dark vision, and you can give your dragon reasonable commands that it will follow, unless it feels like doing otherwise. The dragon is not just friendly to you, it will give its life to save yours, because if you die, it immediately dies as well. The dragon suffers some other drawbacks of its own after bonding as well. It loses its breath weapon recharge and has to rest before using it again, and loses all of its legendary actions if it had any. You share a single hit point pool with your dragon, and it's unfortunately your HP maximum, not the dragon's. So you could potentially weaken the dragon considerably in this sense when you bond with it. That single HP pool goes up and down when either you or the dragon heal or take damage. One of the most interesting things is that once bonded, neither you nor the dragon will ever die of natural causes. You're immortal in that sense. You can also extend your dragon bonded powers to your entire party. With a mere one hour ritual, everyone in your party can gain the language of draconic, have dark vision, and gain resistance to your dragon's type of breath weapon. All these benefits last as long as the bonded pair are alive. 
And finally, the most fascinating thing of all, from a gameplay and enjoyment perspective, it suggested that all of the players at the table can control the dragon. This is a pretty important discussion you'll need to have at the table because if only one player is dragon bonded and is controlling the dragon, then the spotlight will end up being on them quite a bit more than everyone else. But if everyone gets a hand at dictating the dragon's words and actions, it could spread the fun out quite a bit. An Exor Dragon is a dangerous, ruthless, and relatively primitive monster that resides on the Red Moon, which is the moon that is home to about 99% of dragons in the setting. They tend to be hunters who like to ambush their prey, and this really does bear out in the actions. They have a burrowing speed that is equal to their ground and climbing speed of 60 feet, and their action burrowing ambush is extremely potent. At any time, it can burrow as a bonus action, and while it's burrowing, burrowing ambush allows it to force a DC 22 dex check on any character to knock them prone. And besides that, they have a Scorching Sand Breath attack that does 11d6 fire damage and 11d6 slashing damage on a failed save, and half of that when the save is successful. It's interesting to see these lesser dragons as compared to the boss dragons featured in Great Worms of Draka. Not every dragon fight needs to be the final end cap to a campaign, although this is a challenge 18 creature, so it would still be a pretty serious encounter. Wada are mentioned in the Dragon Bond World Primer and described as bloated bipedal amphibians with brains that kind of sit out in the open air. They rule small plots of territory in the Underdark world called Hollow Depths on the continent of Valerna. The whole concept of Hollow Depth feels very different from the world above ground. Everything is weirder, more nightmarish and chaotic. And the Wada are a perfect example of that. They not only control lesser creatures with their giant brains, they have the ability to capture the thoughts and memories of their victims and eat them or serve them to others at a time of their choosing. From an encounter perspective, they're not particularly hard to kill. The most interesting approach with Wada would probably be to use them in a political or inter-social capacity where PCs need to strike a deal with one in order to get something else that they can't normally get in the hollow dark. This could be especially interesting with the interplay of other trusted NPCs because WADA are able to take over the will of others, so parties would really need to double check who they could actually trust when WADA are involved. The Dream Spy is described as a Vala fueled spy or assassin who works for any number of factions. The most defining feature of this subclass is the list of 13 arcane espionage tricks that you can pick from. At level 3, you can pick two of these, and a third at level 9, and a fourth at level 15. These use charisma as the ability modifier when rolling on these, and I really appreciate the shorter descriptions here. I think the longer an ability's description, the less it allows for the GM and player's imaginations to blossom at the table. At level 9, spells, abilities, and traits that can locate a creature will always fail on you. At level 13, anytime you land a hit when you rolled advantage, the target has to pass a con check or you get to roll a whopping extra 4d6 damage for that attack. And at level 17, anyone who sees you while you're trying to sneak around has to pass a whiz check or they forget you for a full minute. Their minds simply can't register your existence for that duration. The Galadian Knight is a paladin subclass, hailing from the setting's Oath of Radiance, an order that follows the continent's biggest, most violent religion. You get a smattering of 5e open gaming license spells as listed here, but there are a few more special ones that you can unlock. At third level, Channel Divinity forces every enemy within 30 feet to make a charisma save or take a small amount of radiant damage. Actually, they take damage either way. On a fail, any null or aberration creature is also turned, which means they'll spend a round trying to run away from you. You can also use Channel Divinity to give 1d8 temporary hit points to any creature within 30 feet of you. At level 7, Brilliant Excoriation sort of debuffs a target so that within that round, whoever else attacks them gets to roll advantage. Amorotic Censure at level 15 adds potential blindness to any target that you do radiant damage on. And at level 20, Avatar of Light allows you to create a cloud of light that gives you a host of combat buffs, but not ones that you can extend to others. The Gladiator subclass in Dragonbond 
is pretty straightforward in terms of gameplay. Arena training gives you proficiency in performance and an incentive to use light or no armor. Emboldened performance is pretty fun. If you have an audience watching you fight, you get a bonus to both your attack rolls and your damage rolls equal to the number of creatures watching and reacting to you. This bonus is limited to your proficiency bonus, but still, that's a generous bonus even if you've drawn a small crowd. And not to min-max here, but the rule doesn't say whether or not other party members themselves could count as audience members. If it's the case that they can, then that's potentially a semi-permanent bonus to attack and damage. That is, if the rest of the party wants to play along with the charade. At level 7, Martial Inspiration allows you to add 1d8 to another person's attack or damage roll on their next turn. Victorious Exhilaration at level 10 allows you to pick up bits of temporary hit points every time you get the killing blow on an enemy. Embellished Strike at level 18 gives you some extra damage on melee attacks. The School of Entropy, or Zyback tradition, churns out so-called Entropists in this world, and they are essentially necromancers. At level 2, you can cast a damaging spell as one that rather heals. At level 6, you get the spells Revivify and Animate Dead if you haven't already picked them up. At level 10, you start making Undead Servants. With the Create Zyback Undead subspell here, you can essentially start raising an undead army. Any raised creature is under your control for 24 hours, after which time they become free agents. But as long as you repeat the ritual each day, you can keep your little collection of undead creatures under your control. I mean, this is the whole reason anyone would play a necromancer, right? The Master of the Cycle feature at level 14 is the most fascinating to me. Check out this first point. You gain the undead creature type. That pretty much says it all. You can no longer heal naturally, you have dark vision, you don't eat or drink. You're immune to disease and exhaustion, and you never die of old age. So basically at level 14, you're undead. I think it's worth mentioning the free adventure that is being put out with the Kickstarter for Itza's Guide to Dragon Bonding, not only because it has what I presume are the abbreviated rules for actual Dragon Bonding, but because it's a really fun and accessible starter adventure for first level characters. I'm not going to spoil the adventure here, but I can say that it takes place on Valeria's Cursed Coast, mostly in a city called Crimson Spires, which was once ruled by the vampiric Tiberian Empire, but is now a city-state run by the Crimson Hawks, a cabal of assassins and criminals. A sage and his protege need protection as they negotiate the purchase of a magical relic that the sage wants to buy, and that's where you and your party come in. The adventure is solidly written and illustrated and runs about 30 pages total. I haven't been able to dive completely into Itza's Guide to Dragon Bonding yet, but from what I've seen as covered in this video, I have three things I want to keep an eye on and three things I'm excited about. The first thing I'm curious about is if they will be expanding the rules on Dragon Bonding beyond what is described in the free adventure. On the one hand, I kind of love how they don't go into the details of what the bonding ritual entails. They just give you the DCs on four different roles you need to make. On the other hand, I'm worried that this might turn some people off. A lot of GMs really just want stuff spelled out for them, down to every last detail, and that's fine. Coming up with little details can be a lot of work, and a lot of folks don't like what they would consider prep. The second thing I'd like to know is just what those three new classes, the Dragon Hunter, Dragon Herald, and Vala Adept, are like. Class abilities are at the heart of any 5e game, so I'm really curious to find out what they've come up with there. And finally, on the other side of the 5e play experience coin, I'd like to see what their 50 plus monsters are like. The many monsters and enemies described in the Great Worms of Draka adventure were pretty impressive in terms of their descriptions and illustrations. My hope is that Draco Studios is able to sustain that level of quality and imagination in It's As Guide. The three things I'm just excited about with this project are, one, the dragon bonding itself. By giving a party their own dragon they can sort of control, the game opens itself to a whole new dimension of battles, and playing that dragon in an encounter intelligently and with forethought is built into the game because the dragon has relatively fewer hit points and breath weapon uses and its life is tied to one of the party members. It's just generally a well-conceived idea that I think would be a lot of fun to play with. I'm also excited to see if they are expanding on hollow dark creatures and society in this book. The Wada stat block really got my imagination going in terms of what kind of social interplay can unfold in the weird underworld that is hinted at in the setting primer. 
And finally, I'm excited to see 3D printable models for these new dragon broods and enemies. I don't know for sure if they're going to be on offer during or after the Kickstarter for Itza's Guide, but it's something I'm willing to bet Draco Studios will want to provide at some point. Having 3D model counterparts for their Dragon Bond world is one of the big attractions of the game, at least for me personally. And relatively speaking, since 5e is such a tactical combat simulator, there's ample reason to actually use those models at the table. Well, that's all I've got for now. If you'd like to know more about Itza's Guide to Dragon Bonding, click on the link below and take a look at the project. Let me know in the comments if you're backing this one and what you're most excited about. Thanks for watching. See ya.